Okay, this is part of our series of biology webinars where we're going over one chapter each time. Uh, this chapter, this webinar covers all four sections in the chapter about photosynthesis, uh, which is actually chapter eight. Sorry about that. Make that an eight. Um, there's some questions as part of this webinar that will come up as polls, just like you did. Those are just for practice. They're not graded or anything, and nobody can see your individual answers, just the group's answers as a, to as a whole. So please participate in all of those quick poll questions, and that will help us uh, see if there's anything that I need to do better to explain, and it will also kind of help you keep your brain going and, and review what you can uh, remember from the lesson as we go through it. Um, if you have any questions for me, you can definitely ask questions. If you're looking at this on a computer or a laptop, you should see a little speech bubble here that you would click to ask questions, and that um, will bring up a, an extra little window where you can type. And if you're on a phone or a tablet, you get this little question mark icon. Click that, and you can ask questions. So I'll just keep an eye out for that. As you send questions, I'll try to pause and answer them, or wait till the end of the section and answer them. So you're not really going to be interrupting at all. Just um, ask if you have anything. OK, um, so I'm going to get going on this presentation about chapter 8. So in this chapter, we talk about energy and how chemical energy works and then how we get it from photosynthesis. So first of all, um, it starts out by talking about how your body is constantly using energy. So we think about using energy um, when we're doing physical activity. That's when you're using a lot of it. But you're also using energy just sitting in a chair or sleeping. Your body is always going through processes like breathing, digesting, and plump pumping blood. And on a cellular level, energy is used for most of the processes carried out by organelles. So your cells are busy no matter what you're doing. So where do you get the energy that you need to live? Well, you get it from the food that you eat. Um, if you're eating meat, then the animal that you're eating has energy stored in its cells, which it got from eating plants. And the plants got the energy stored it in their cells, and they got that energy from sunlight. So in this example, both you and the animal are considered heterotrophs. Heterotrophs are organisms that get their energy by eating. The plants had energy stored in their cells, which the plants got from sitting in the sun. So plants are considered autotrophs. They don't need to eat. They make their own food. So it's important to highlight that all of the energy that we get starts with the sun and is stored by plants and then moves up the food chain. So we're talking about energy, but there's lots of different forms of energy. What kind of energy do cells actually use? Well, cells use what's called chemical energy, and this is energy that's stored in the bonds between molecules. All chemical reactions require making and breaking bonds, and all chemical reactions will either use up energy or release energy when this happens. So there's one particular molecule that cells utilize a lot for their energy needs, and it's called ATP. Um, that's short for adenosine triphosphate because the molecule has an adenosine and three phosphates, triphosphate. That's, that's these here. They're the phosphates. Um, ATP is a pretty big molecule. Um, it's made of these parts, adenosine, ribose, and three phosphate groups that are all attached together. But the last phosphate can be broken off and releasing energy that was stored in that bond. When the phosphate group is removed, now the molecule only has two phosphates, so it becomes AD ADP, which stands for adenosine diphosphate. So when it has three of them on there, it's triphosphate, tri for three. So it's ATP. And when it only has two, it's adenosine diphosphate, ADP. 
So ATP stores the energy, one of the phosphates gets broken off, the energy is released, and then it becomes ADP, diphosphate. But this can be recycled, so when the cell has more energy again, it can um, put that phosphate back on there by soaking up some energy, and then it could store the energy there for later. So, um, what is this used for? Basically, everything that the cell does. Cells use ATP to fuel transport across cell membranes, make muscle cells move, build proteins, build other cell parts, many other jobs. Anything that the cell needs some energy to do, it's probably using ATP for it. So, ATP is used for working energy. It's short-term energy storage. Uh, but the cell does not use ATP for long-term energy storage because it's not very stable. So for better storage of energy, cells use glucose molecules. Glucose is a type of sugar, and it's what plants create through a process called photosynthesis. So before we move on to what photosynthesis is, um, we got a couple of review questions from this section. So I'm going to put the next one up is a poll, so please answer this. Um, so if Gary here is a vegetarian that only eats plants, never animals, is Gary a heterotroph? Okay, so you should see a poll on your screen now, and we need to get almost everybody to vote before we can move on, so please answer it. And I see just over half of you have voted, so I'm going to give you another 30 seconds for us to get those last votes in. What do you think? Is Gary a heterotroph if he only eats plants? Okay, so our results are in. We have 71% of you said yes, he is, and 29% of, of you said no, he's not. Um, so our answer to this is Gary a heterotroph. So let's think about what a heterotroph means. A heterotroph is something that has to eat to get its energy. So it doesn't matter what something is eating to get its energy. If it's eating, it's a heterotroph. And the other word was autotroph. Um, if you're not a heterotroph, that means you have to be an autotroph. Autotrophs don't eat, they make their own energy. So most of the autotrophs in the whole world are plants because they get their energy from sunlight and they don't actually have to eat. So if Gary's eating nothing but vegetables, he's still a heterotroph because he's getting his energy by eating something. All right, we have one more review question from this section. Which is true about ATP? Let me get that poll up. Okay, there we go. Again, same thing. We'll give you about a minute to look at your answers. Think about what we just learned about ATP. It's okay if you're not sure. Just put what you think is the best guess, and we'll go from there.
Okay, good job team. You guys answered this one a lot faster. I see almost 90% of you answered. Um, I did see one student just kind of came in a minute ago, so if um, if that's you that didn't answer yet, don't worry about it. You can kind of catch up with the next section. And um, I also want to point out that you will get an email um, either tonight or tomorrow, probably tonight, that has a recording of this session and links to the other recordings of these sessions. So if you came in late and you missed a little bit or you want to watch this again later when you're you're studying, that's fine. You can watch it anytime you want. So make sure to check the, your email to get those recordings. Okay, so it looks like our poll results. We had 50% uh, of you say answer C. ATP is better for storing energy than glucose. So let's see. Our, our actual correct answer is A. So 25% of you said A. Good job. ATP only holds energy for short-term jobs. So we associate ATP with energy in biology. We're always talking about ATP is where we get the energy. It's how the cells use energy. But it's working energy. It's for we need energy right now. We need to move it around the cell and use it. What do we use? We use ATP. If we're talking about storing energy to use later, so something eats food and it's got to store it for later, or the plants are getting energy from the sun and they need to store it for later so they can grow, they're not going to use ATP. They're going to use glucose. Um, so C is actually um, the opposite of this. So glucose is better for storing energy than ATP. Or we could cross this out and we could say ATP is worse for storing energy. It's not very stable, so it only works short term. And I don't think anybody said B, which is good. ATP is less energy than ADP. That's the opposite. So ATP has lots of stored energy, and then it releases it when it becomes ADP. All right, and D, the energy is stored and released from the adenosine part of ATP. Um, it's actually the phosphates. So the difference between these two molecules, ATP is three phosphates. ADP only has two. So the energy was stored right here in this bond between the phosphates. Okay, so the adenosine isn't where the energy is stored. It's part of the molecule, but it's just over here, not doing anything at this point. It's the phosphates that matter. All right, so we're going to move into Chapter 8, Section 2, where we talk about what photosynthesis is. So photosynthesis is a series of chemical reactions, and it's actually pretty complex. There's lots of steps. There's lots of things going on. There's lots of molecules involved. But the main idea is that you're taking energy from sunlight, going through several molecules, and using it to make glucose molecules that store energy. So we're not going to go into the details of it because you already have a photosynthesis video linked to lesson two in your student portal, but here's an overview of what goes on. Hold on, guys. Sorry. Okay. Uh, I had a question come in. That was, what chapter is this about? It's chapter 8. Okay. So, anyway, um, chloroplasts are the organelles and plant cells that we associate with photosynthesis because this is where it happens. Um, chloroplasts have sacs inside of them called dilacoids. So, they're always drawn as kind of flat green sacs. And the Thylakoids are filled with a pigment called chlorophyll, and that's what makes plants green, is the chlorophyll. Um, okay, so chloroplasts have sacs inside of them called thylakoids, filled with chlorophyll, and the chlorophyll's job is to absorb the energy from sunlight and kick off these chemical reactions with that energy. The chemical reactions start happening on the thylakoids, so right on these membranes here, is where the photosynthesis ha happens. 
So what goes on? What, what do we do with this energy from the sun? The solar energy absorbed by the chlorophyll goes into chlorophyll's electrons. Those electrons are passed around on carrier molecules. An important carrier molecule is called NADP+, and that stands for a big long word that we're not going to bother to remember. Just call it NADP+. And that takes some of the high energy electrons and also a hydrogen atom to help hold them on and becomes NADPH. It then moves to wherever the energy is needed and releases the electrons um, releasing that energy and becoming NADP plus again. So this is a carrier molecule. Its job is just to take the energy and kind of move it from place to place with these electrons. There's two main phases of photosynthesis. They are the light dependent reactions which take place on the thylakoids in the chloroplasts and they require light to get started. That's why they're called light dependent. They can't happen if there's no light. They use the energy from the light in a complex series of reactions to make NADPH and ATP. In the process they use water and also release oxygen atoms, releasing the oxygen that humans and other animals need to breathe. Then the NADPH and ATP from the light dependent reactions is set to the next set of reactions, which are called the light independent reactions. So these can happen whether it's light out or not. This phase uses the energy from the NADPH and the ATP to build molecules of glucose. It builds them with carbon dioxide that the plant takes in from the air and some molecules made of chains of five carbon atoms which were already in the plant. They are made in a different step. Okay, so um, this is just your overview of what goes on in these two phases. So again, the light reactions use light and water, release oxygen, and create ATP and NADPH. The ATP and NADPH fuel the light, whoa, sorry, <laughs> fuel the light independent reactions, which use organic molecules and carbon dioxide to create sugar molecules, particularly glucose. Um, so that slide got a little messy, but the, the important things are here. You've got the light dependent reactions, needs light, needs water, and it creates NADPH and ATP, and it also makes oxygen that it just gets rid of, and then we breathe it in. The light independent reactions use that ATP and NADPH, so they go from this first set of reactions to the second one. They use carbon dioxide, and what it releases is glucose. Okay, so we can summarize photosynthesis, even though there's lots more molecules involved in the machinery of photosynthesis, um, if we just look at what gets used up and what gets released, we can summarize it this way. You have six carbon dioxide atoms, six oxygen atoms, and sunlight, and it yields one glucose molecule and six oxygen atoms. Okay, so I would um, write down this formula, remember it for later, keep it in your notes for taking the test. It's kind of important to know what goes in and what comes out of photosynthesis. And that as actually sums up section two. So oh, let me bring up the polls for the end of this section. So which of the following, and we've got a uh, multiple answers here, you can pick more than one, which of the following are produced in the light dependent reactions? Oh, I didn't hit launch, I'm sorry. There you go, okay. So now you can um, take this poll, think about which ones are produced in the light dependent reactions. And I'll tell you there's definitely more than one answer. Take about a minute and vote on that.
And I'll give you another 20 seconds or so to get a couple more votes in. Oh, and we're at 100%. All right. Um, okay, so our votes are uh, kind of all over the place, which is partially good because we got a lot of correct answers. So it's 67% say water. Oxygen was 44. ATP. Carbon dioxide. 33% of both of you said, or 33% uh, of you said those, and... NADPH 56. All right, so I think this is pretty good. We're going to close the poll and see the answers. Which of the following are produced in the light dependent reaction? So, how about water? Water is actually used up in the light dependent reactions. So, it's taken in, it's broken apart, and it's used for other stuff. Um, oxygen is produced in the light dependent reactions, it's released into the air. So if you said oxygen, good job. ATP is produced in the light-dependent reactions. Carbon dioxide is not. It is um, only in the light-independent reactions and is not produced by the plant. It's soaked up from the air. And our last one, NADPH, most of you said that one. Um, that is produced. So this is definitely something to... review. One thing to remember is that these two molecules, ATP and NADPH, are created in the light dependent reactions and then they go on to the next phase. They go to the light independent reactions. Okay, and we've got one more review question and then we'll go on to the last section. Okay, so, um, oh, <laughs> I didn't realize, I didn't animate those answers, so if you saw them, pretend you didn't. Okay, um, so the flat sacks of membranes inside of chloroplasts, what are those called? Okay, we're almost at 100%. Just a few more seconds here, and we'll get the last votes in. Oh, so 57% of you said thylakoids, and that is correct. So stroma is the um, fluid-filled space in the chloroplast. So if you said that, you were at least on the right track. It's part of the chloroplast, but it's not the membranes. Um, chloroplastoids is something that I made up, so <laughs> that's not correct. Thylakoids is the correct answer, and ADP is a molecule, not part of the um, organelle. So Good job to most of you that said thylakoids. Um, and if you didn't say that, then make sure you go back and review the parts of the chloroplast from the beginning of section 8.2. Okay, and then chapter 8, section 3 in your textbook details the process of photosynthesis. And we're not going to go through it in any more depth right now because you have a video on it. So please watch the video that's embedded in your course for this information. Um, you would just click on the photosynthesis review video. And at the end of this section, it also talks about these 
couple other topics. Um, what affects the rate of photosynthesis? So um, you've got three different things. Temperature, if it's too hot or too cold, photosynthesis will be slower. It needs to be right at the perfect range. The light intensity, so the brighter the light is, the faster photosynthesis happens. And water, um, if there's not enough water available, then photosynthesis will slow down. And the last thing it talks about in this chapter is some other versions of photosynthesis. So plants um, lose water when they take in carbon dioxide through their pores. It lets water out at the same time. So for plants in wet environments, that's okay, but for desert plants, that's a problem. So there's two different strategies that desert plants have evolved. One is to have a special chemical pathway called C4 that gets carbon into the Calvin cycle even when the pores are closed. So during the day it can have them closed and still end up with carbon. The other is what's called CAM plants and these open their pores to take in carbon dioxide at night when they will lose less water and store the carbon dioxide as carbon in their um, cells until daytime when there's sunlight and they can go through the rest of photosynthesis. So C4 pathway and CAM plants are just two alternate versions that both have the goal of allowing the plant to use carbon dioxide without losing too much water. And that actually wraps up the chapter. Um, so I've only got one question during the thing, so I'm going to stick around for a few more minutes. If you have questions, you can definitely ask them by clicking the question icon on your GoToWebinar. And if you are watching it live, you'll definitely want to check out the recordings later. That will be emailed to you. And if you're watching it live or watching a recording, um, you can use either of these methods here to contact your instructors with any questions you have about this class.